Okay. So, hello everyone, um, and welcome to the second seminar presentation. I hope that you can all see my slides. Um, I would, Daniel, can you give me a thumbs up? Um, yeah, you, okay. the slides are visible. Okay, marvelous. So I will deliver this presentation in a similar vein as I did with the previous one when I talked about uh, Merleau-Ponty's conception of speech and language. Uh, I would again uh, like to kindly thank Daniel for inviting me and uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to um, work on uh, one of my personal favorite books of all time, Phenomenology of Perception, together with you. Um, I would um, also kindly ask you to just jot down any questions or comments that you might have during the presentation uh, so that we can discuss, discuss it afterwards. I'm hoping that I will be able to present everything in approximately one hour so that we will have enough time to go through um, <clears throat> some questions. And that's basically it. So let me start with the presentation. So today we will be um, focusing again, basically, because we touched upon this already last week um, on the fourth chapter of the second part of Phenomenology of Perception. The title of this section is called Other Selves and the Human World. And basically the section focuses on the question of the other and the question of intersubjectivity. As I already mentioned last time, uh, a good rule of thumb when you're reading Merleau-Ponty is basically to always try to contextualize uh, the section that you're reading. So I know this sounds trivial, but with Merleau-Ponty becomes even more important because he just he's not particularly friendly friendly to the reader in the sense of uh, trying to find ways to get him or her into the section, into the particular particular topic that he will be um, um, covering. So it makes good sense to always try to put what you're reading into a broader context. And I would like to draw a parallel here with uh, what we said in my first uh, presentation, the one on speech. There I said that, um, in the first part, Merleau-Ponty focuses on the body and he tries to reconceptualize the body and then he tries to show what are the implications of this conception of the body if taken into different domains, into different spheres. And before he covers the topic of language there, the topic of speech, he touches upon the topic of sexuality. And the reason why he does so is because he tries to show that if you take on board his new conception of the body, what you see is that sexuality, which is normally conceived as something that is very physiological, as a blind desire, um, becomes something that is more than merely a physiological phenomenon. And then when he moves to language or speech, he, he tries to show that language or speech is not something that would be uh, uh, related strictly and solely to the intellect, to the mind. So he's trying to take two seemingly very separate, even opposite phenomena. Sexuality is something that is considered to be very carnal, very physiological, and then language, that is something that is usually considered as uh, very intellectual, something very intellectual, very mental, and show that this new conception of the body sheds very novel light on these two phenomena, whereby um, sexuality becomes less of an automatic physiological phenomenon, whereas language becomes uh, less of a strictly intellectual uh, mental phenomenon. There is a corpor corporeal aspect to language. And something similar is at work here. So the section prior to the one that we'll be talking about today deals with the thing and the natural world. 
in this particular section, I know that you basically skipped this section, although it's a very important one, but it's also a very, very dense section. So I understand why Daniel decided to skip this particular section. Uh, Merleau-Ponty focuses on the question of the nature of the natural world. And what he's trying to show here is that the natural world, if you take on board everything that has been um, dealt with prior to this in phenomenology of perception, that natural world, world cannot be construed along the lines of a mechanistic world worldview. So uh, natural world and natural things cannot be understood as, say, uh, mechanical or, say, geometricized objects. Um, and in this particular section, he moves on to the question of the social world, the human world, and other selves. And here he will try to show that the cultural world is not merely an intellectual construct. So if natural world is not something that exists in and of itself and can be construed mechanically, mechanistically, social world is not merely a construct, an intellectual construct. Again, by introducing the notion of the body, he will try to show that both of these conceptions are misguided and that they both are founded on a similar presupposition that is problematic. Okay, so... Um, uh, the central problem that he will be dealing with in this particular section is the so-called problem of the others or the problem of other minds. So this is a famous philosophical problem, one of the most important or most pertinent philosophical problems uh, in philosophy, um, aside uh, for those who think that these are basically pseudo problems. Uh, and the, 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 the central, so, so the crux or the core of this problem is how do I know that other people have minds, that they have consciousness, so that the that other living beings, that other human beings are minded beings, that behind the physical corporeal facade that I see lies a mind if this is even uh, the appropriate way to phrase, uh, appropriate way to phrase the question. And Merleau-Ponty will try to argue that it isn't. But this is the problem of the others. How do I know that other beings are minded, that they have minds, that they have consciousnesses? And this problem uh, parallels another similar problem, problem the one that Merleau-Ponty basically tackles in the previous section, and that is the problem of the external world. The problem of if all that I am given are my subjective, um, is my subjectivity, are phenomena that are given in the sphere of my experience, how do I know that there exists an exter external world? Put differently, if what I'm giving are merely mental representations of external things, how do I know that these representations actually represent something that is out there and that they are not merely a mental construct? Um, the reason why these questions are problematic, the question of the other and the question of the external world, is because they boil down to the question or problem of solipsism. Sartre called this the reef of solipsism, because it seems that this is the reef upon which many uh, philosophical boats uh, land and they break apart. Um, so solipsism is basically um, this idea where uh, the, the knowledge of anything that is out, outside of the scope of my subjectivity becomes problematic. So sole ipse, um, uh, solus ipse, so uh, only I exist. So, and 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 then of course the question is, how do I know that there is anything beyond the realm of my subjectivity, the realm beyond the realm of mindness, beyond the realm of my ego, of myself? This is the problem of solipsism, and most philosophical uh, currents try to dodge 
this bullet. They do not want to be labeled as solipsistic. So if you end up in a solipsistic position, this is basically something of an reductio ad absurdum for, a, for that particular philosophical position. The way Merleau-Ponty phrases this in the text is uh, as follows. He says, the body of another like my own is an object standing before me, before the consciousness which thinks about or constitutes it. Other men and myself seen as empirical beings are merely pieces of mechanism worked by springs, but the true subject is irrepeatable for that consciousness which is hidden in so much flesh and blood is the least intelligible of occult qualities. So the, the problem being is when I look at other people, all I see is their bodies. All I see are, at least so it would seem, intricate mechanisms. And how do I know that there is consciousness um, permeating these um, uh, um, lumps of flesh and blood? So this is the itinerary for today. Uh, at the beginning, we'll take a look of the transition from the previous section to, the, this, sec to, to this section, so from nature to culture. Then we'll uh, take a look at the problem of objective thought. Then we'll focus on the experience of the body. And from there, we will move on to the topic of intercorporeality. And finally, if there's enough time, I'll touch upon the question or the problem of transcendence, which for Merleau-Ponty is the central problem of his undertaking in phenomenology of perception. By the way, although he constantly emphasizes that this is the central problem, surprisingly few interpreters have picked up on this. And this is something that is very seldom mentioned in sec sec secondary literature. So the question or the problem of transcendence as being the central topic or central problem for Merleau-Ponty. And then also um, there are correspondingly few analysis as to how he actually goes about dealing and solving this. So anyway, Merleau-Ponty starts this section with, with the following sentence. I'm thrown into a nature and that nature appears not only as outside me, in objects devoid of history, but it is also discernible at the center of subjectivity. So whenever I look around myself, I am surrounded by nature. I am surrounded by natural objects, trees, rivers, and whatnot. And also this nature is something that I find within myself. So, um, you know, I'm working on a paper, I'm thinking about these lofty ideas, about the nature of reality, the self and the others. And then I have to go and I have to, you know, drink something because I become thirsty or I become hungry or I get distracted because there's an itch or there's an ache or whatnot. So the nature um, is present, as he says, at the very center of my subjectivity. Um, and it manifests in different ways, in, in some of the ways I've already uh, described, but also in you know, just the, the normal functioning of my sense organs or whatnot. Before we continue with this, I would just like to again point out what Merleau-Ponty is trying to do He's here. He's trying to connect the previous section, which was focusing, which was uh, uh, aimed at the topic or the question of the natural world with this section, which is focusing on the question of the cultural world. But also, as you will see, he's also trying to already establish a link between this particular part, so the second part of the book, and the last, that is to say, the third part of the book, where one of the central uh, notions will be time, temporality. Temporality will play the key role in Merleau-Ponty's uh, solution to the problem of transcendence that I will briefly mention today. So, you know, th these are these small pointers or small hints that you can find in the book, and you can so easily overlook them because he doesn't really say what he's doing. But once you get familiar with the work, you see that he's actually being quite skillful in how he has structured the work. So at this point, Merleau-Ponty 
juxtaposes two times, the natural time and personal time. Natural time, he says, is an anonymous, anonymous or pre-personal life. It is an amorphous existence that is always present in my uh, existential ex uh, experiential field. And there is, of course, personal life, uh, personal time, which is related to my personal life, individual life. So again, you can think of these two uh, in terms of personal time being related to my personal project, projects I'm engaged with as a minded being, as someone who is part of an intercultural uh, sphere and is involved in cultural topics, cult cultural questions, cultural objects, and so on and so forth. Natural time, on the other hand, is related to this anonymous or pre-personal current of existence that is flowing through me and manifests itself in the normal functioning of my sense organs in various needs, in various desires, and so on and so forth. His first work, The Structure of Behavior, Merleau-Ponty, following Hegel actually, uh, pens down the following sentence. For life as for mind, there is no past which is absolutely past. So for us as minded beings, this vital slash corporeal existence, this anonymous current of existence that I just mentioned, uh, is something that is always present. And Merleau-Ponty says the following, in order to have some inkling of the nature of that amorphous existence, which preceded my own history and which will bring it to a close, I have only to look within me at that time which pursues its own indep independent course and which my personal life utilizes, but does not entirely overlay. So there is this natural time that runs its own course. And this is what, for example, Buddhists call anika, uh, anitsa or anika. Uh, it's pronounced differently. Um, it's basically the impermanence of existence, the impermanence of all phenomena. And this is basically what is typical of natural time. It runs its own course. It's, it temporarily creates certain forms, certain gestalten, but then it also... Uh, um, destroys them, eliminates them. And whether I like it or not, you know, I need only to look into the mirror. And what I see is despite how I might, how I may feel or think about myself, there is a, a, a face of a 40 year old person uh, looking at someone who uh, intuitively would probably still be engaged in something like uh, 25 or 30 year old um, um, project this, uh, of projects of a 25 or 30 year old self. So, you know, there is this time which pursues its own independent course. And he says, our personal life utilizes this time, but it can never completely transcend it. It can never completely negate it. So um, when he talks about the relationship between natural and personal time, he says that in personal time, I have a precarious hold uh, of, my, of my past and also my future. So I have a specific hold that is at a distance from my past. And he gives an example of myself looking at my uh, past from my present experience. And he says... You know, I can, I can look at my past and things that have happened there from a very different perspective and a very different, uh, from, a, from a very different point of view. You know, yeah, I have become familiar with phenomenology. I have become familiar with existentialism, with psychotherapy, with, Buzi with Buddhism with, and whatnot. And when I look at my childhood with all this acquired knowledge and all these acquired experiences, I can all of, a, uh, all of a sudden change the specific meanings, change the way I see certain events in my childhood. They become embedded in larger contexts and thereby the gestalt of the past changes. So, so what I look and what I see when I look uh, 
into the past from my present experience. I can change it in light of my acquired knowledge and my experiences. But I can always do it in a precarious way. So what that means that basically I can shift my point of view constantly. So even my new meaning may change in a week's time or maybe in half a year or maybe in five years. So there's always this precarious, uncertain hold of my past. And this is related to what has been said before, that the personal time uses natural time, but never completely transcends it. That is why Merleau-Ponty says that natural time is a ground for personal time, but it is also a source of danger. What does he mean by that? He says that natural time flows, as I've said, it temporarily creates certain gestalten, certain structures, certain forms, but it also eventually destroys them. Uh, so there's always this perpetual uh, upsurge of novelty whereby all is taken up and then transcended. And this is an ongoing thing. It's something that I cannot, cannot do anything about. But this is useful for me because it provides a ground for my reflective acts. So I, as a minded being, as a being that is in the a possession of a mind can use this dynamics of temporality because it allows me to constantly renew the way I construe and the way I see and the way I understand things. So the fact that my present will sooner or later dissolve into a new, into the upcoming future, and I cannot do anything about that, is something that also allows me to constantly modify my understanding of the world, my understanding of myself. Or as Merleau-Ponty puts it, um, natural time opens a totally new future to me, able to, which allows me to reflect upon the opacity of the present. So my present is surrounded by these, by this atmosphere of uncertainty, by this atmosphere of indeterminacy. And with each new act, which allows me to move transition from my present into the future or allows the new future to arrive into my present or become my new present. Um, this is something that allows me to shed new light on this opacity of my present. So there is room for novelty. There is room for recreation. There is room for creation because of the fact that my personal time is grounded on the natural. But there is also a source of danger. Why? Because he says, my lived, what I'm experiencing as lived, is ne never completely comprehensible. Every act that I do, every personal act, every act of reflection, catches upon a certain threat that is implicitly present in my existence, that is implicitly present in my lived experience. But it never fully exhausts it. So there are always new horizons that are opened and are being opened up and they're inexhaustible. So because there's always new future that will bring new horizons and new possibilities, I am never quite at one with myself. As I said before, I lived through a certain moment of my past, but now 20 years later, I can see it from a very different perspective. So my past has changed now. And it will change in the future as well, very probably. So there is never an apodictic certainty. I can never reach the Archimedean point where I would say, now I have an overview of my life and I completely understand both myself and the world because these two are dynamically intertwined and they constantly change precisely because temporality is at their very core. So again, natural time, which runs its own course, is at the same time the ground and the source of my personal time, source of danger for my personal time. It allows the personal acts of, to unfold because every personal act, every act of reflection requires temporality, requires this movement from now into the future or coming of future into the now. But at the same time, it is the source of danger because it constantly dissolves what I've created in a specific moment. But then Merleau-Ponty 
transitions towards the cultural wor world. And he says the following, just as nature finds its way to the core of my personal life and becomes inextricably linked with it. So just as this anonymous current is always present in every, uh, in, in all of my uh, personal projects, so behavior patterns, so the patterns that I do as a minded being, as someone who is engaged in certain personal projects, settle, in, settle into that nature, being deposited in the form of a cultural world. So not only does nature permeate culture, so not only does nature permeate what I call my personal self, my personal realm, and this personal realm, as we will see, is a profoundly and essentially intersubjective realm, but also this intersubjective realm, this personal realm, the cultural realm, permeates nature. So nature and culture for a human being are basically intertwined. They interweave, they interlock. When I look around myself, I see natural objects, as I've already said, I see earth, I see air, I see trees, and so on and so forth. And these, Merleau-Ponty says, are tracks left by this generalized anonymous existence. So it is this profound, this is, it is this deep and anonymous existence, which precedes not only myself, but very probably also my cultural milieu, and perhaps even humanity. As such, it is this that's ha that has allowed me to open up into these specific natural objects. So these are objects that are given to me as a physical, uh, uh, as a psychophysical being. So these natural objects, again, are laid down by sensory and perceptual functions. Uh, they are the result of different dispersed consciousnesses, as he calls them, that are part of and are integrated in my perceptual field. So consciousnesses such as sight, hearing, and touch. But I also see cultural objects. I see roads, I see villages, I see churches, I see pipes, at least my Ponty seems to have seen quite a lot of pipes. I see pipes, I see mugs, I see computers. And each of these cultural objects spreads around it an atmosphere of humanity. So these were not laid down by sensory and perceptual functions, but by spontaneous acts of human beings. And they are suffused, they are permeated uh, and surrounded by the atmosphere of humanity. I feel that these are uh, somehow related to other human beings. Now, Miropunti says, how is this possible? He says, it seems very strange, at least, coming from a very specific cultural and philosophical tradition, dating back at least to Descartes. So coming from this particular perspective, it may seem strange that the spontaneous acts, so acts done by minded beings, by, by free autonomous beings, through, through which man has patterned his life should be deposited like some sediment outside himself and lead an anonymous existence as things. So I look around myself, I see a mug. I see a mug and this mug is given to me as a mug, not as a specific object that has a specific color and a specific texture, but as something that I can use for something. It is something that gives, gives itself to me as a specific affordance, as something that affords specific patterns of behavior, specific patterns of manipulating this particular entity. And it is out there almost as an, uh, uh, as an anonymous existence, as a thing in its own right. And Merleau-Ponty says, you know, I can see this very cl clearly in my own civilization because, you know, I understand the objects I'm surrounded by um, in my own civilization. I know how to use them. I know what they mean. But interestingly enough, he says, as a human being, even if I'm encountered with objects from an unknown or alien civilization, let's say some civilization that, that is discovered by the, by the archeologists or whatnot, although I may not know what these objects uh, are supposed to mean, what their function is, I still recognize the, 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 the marks of humanity in them. 
But in this particular uh, example, it is um, the, the, their meaning is ambiguous. It is there, but it is ambiguous, so, but it's still there. So I recognize this uh, stamp of humanity in these particular objects. And we could draw an interesting an uh, parallel here um, that Merleau-Ponty draws in the structure of behavior, where he says that even though child does not know language, he recognizes specific patterns and structures that belong to the language as something that is of relevance and something that he needs to decipher. So for him, these are not just random sounds like some other sounds that he hears, certain noises or certain natural sounds, but he immediately recognizes the sounds, the patterns uh, that pertain to language. And he's drawn into the linguistic world, even though he doesn't speak any particular language. The same holds true for us. So we immediately recognize the ambiguous meaning that is somehow related to these cultural objects that we're surrounded. Merleau-Ponty phrases it as follows. In the cultural object, I feel the close presence of others beneath a veil of anonymity. Someone uses the pipe for smoking, the spoon for eating, the bell for summoning, and it is through the perception of a human act and another person and the perception of a cultural world that the perception of a cultural world, world could be verified. So I can always see someone using this particular object, and this will then verify that you know this object is in fact a cultural object that becomes a sedimented carrier of a specific behavioral pattern. But you know the, the, the meaning is already there. Now the question that emerges here is the following. How can an action or a human thought, so basically something that seems to be internal, something that seems to be related to my sphere of subjectivity, something that is mental in nature, so a human thought, how can this be grasped in the mode of the one? Since by its very nature, it is a first person operation inseparable from an eye. When I think about a thought, when I think about a certain intention, it is something that is strongly related to uh, to, to, to my first person experience, to something that seems to be relegated to the realm of subjectivity. And yet, here are these objects that are permeated with these intentions, that are in a certain sense sedimented thoughts. And how is this possible? So how am I able to recognize this? So Merleau-Ponty tries to show already at the, at, the, at, the, at the domain of objects, you know, that this question of the other emerges. How can there be more than uh, one subject? Not only that, how can I see the others in what seem like just, you know, anonymous existences out there, cultural objects? And the common response, Merleau-Ponty says, is by the inference by analogy. So this is something that people would normally used to explain this phenomenon. They would say something as follows. I see a certain use made by, made by other men of the implements which surround. So I see someone smoking a pipe, drinking from a mug uh, and whatnot. I interpret this behavior by analogy with my own. So, you know, I also use a pipe in a specific way. I also drink from a mug. And through my inner experience, which teaches me the significance and intention of perceived gesture. So whenever I reach for a cup, whenever I reach for a mug or for a pipe, I have a specific intention. I have a specific thought or what have you. And when I see the other person doing it, although I don't have direct access, access to the subjectivity, to mentality of that other person, I can just you know, infer that what's happening is something that's analogous to what happens with me when I do the same. So I'm basically projecting my own mental state into the other. I'm doing some sort of a implicit or tacit reasoning, uh, a, 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 an implicit or tacit inference. Merleau-Ponty says that this is basically begging the question. How can the word I be put into plural? How can a general idea of the I be formed? How can I speak of an I other than my own? That is to say, how can consciousness, which by its nature and as self-knowledge is in the mode of the I, be grasped in the mode of the Tao and through this in the world of the one? So he basically says, 
subjectivity is always given to me from the first person perspective. I live my uh, subjectivity. I have direct access to it. And it would seem that subjectivity is always related to this I, to this ego. It is something that pertains to myself. It is basically a knowledge that is self-knowledge. How can I all of a sudden now talk about subjectivity in someone else if the nature of subjectivity and consciousness is such that it has to be given from the first person perspective? So, you know, how can I just, you know, pluralize this? How can I move from the I, from my own first person perspective, to the mode of the Tao so that you have the consciousness, that you have the mentality, that you have also the mind that I have? And then move from that, not only to that other person, but to the social sociality as such, to the cultural world, to the one, das man, as, as um, Heidegger calls it. And here is where body enters the picture. So we're moving now away from the question of the, the natural time and personal time. And we see that there's a problem with the cultural objects, namely, you know, how do I know that these cultural objects are actually a sediment, that they are sediments of other consciousnesses. So when I see a pipe, how do, how can I, how am I able to recognize a specific intuition in that object? And sometimes I don't even know what this particular intuition is, but I just see it there. If, you know, consciousness is something that seems to be relegated exclusively to me, to something that is given to me in the first person mode of approaching or accessing things. And this is so now where the body enters the picture. The first, the very first of all cult cultural objects and the one by which all the rest exists is the body of the other person as the vehicle of a form of behavior. What does that mean? So I see a mug. I recognize it as a cultural object. I recognize a specific meaning. I recognize a specific function that it does or can do. Can do. So something, uh, I recognize it as a specific affordance. But I can take this questioning one step further or basically one step back. Namely, I can see the mug being used by the other person. So I know that this is a mug and that the function of it is to allow for drinking a cup of coffee so uh, some coffee or maybe some tea and the reason why I know this is because I see the other person doing it so there is a specific pattern of behavior exhibited by the body of the other person and this is what invests this particular object with this meaning of course normally I don't see it but this is somehow something that I can draw upon or go back to I can say you know basically because I, I have seen other people handle specific objects that I know what their meaning is. But the question is then just moved one way, one step back. So how do I now know that this particular body, that this, specific, uh, that this particular body is a minded body, that there is a mind suffusing this particular body? How do I know that this specific behavioral pattern that I see unfold in front of me is permeated with a specific intention. So the question that emerges here is as follows, whether it be a question of vestige, so, so whether it be a question of cultural objects or the body of another person, we, knew, we need to know how an object in space can become an eloquent relic of an existence how conversely an intention, a thought, or a project can detach themselves from the personal subject and become visible outside him in the shape of his body and in the environment which he builds for himself. That is to say, we need to have an answer as to how a specific object in space, be it this mug or be it the body of the other person, is actually a relic of an existence, a manifestation, of a specific intention. And I also have to be able to understand how a thought or an intention can manifest itself in the world, how it can materialize itself. This, this is the question uh, that lies behind the problem of the other. So the very first of all cultural objects we said is the body. 
And with the body, what we have is the paradox of a consciousness seen from the outside. So I see the other person laughing. I see the other person frowning. And in this laugh, I recognize joy. And in this frown, I recognize anger. So it would seem that the body I'm confronted with, its behavioral patterns, they express a specific attitude. They express a specific intention. A specific intention. So again, I'm confronted with a consciousness which is seen from the outside. And this, Merleau-Ponty says, is a scandal for objective thought. Objective thought cannot process this. This is something that is beyond its, uh, beyond its realm of uh, um, conditions of possibility, so to speak. Or as Merleau-Ponty himself puts it, there is no place for other people and a plurality of consciousness in objective thought. Now, objective thought, I'm pretty sure you have talked about this already and not once, but just so that we are in the clear. Merleau-Ponty frustratingly uses several different terms when he talks about objective thought. Sometimes he will talk about objective thought or objective thinking, but sometimes he will also use other terms. And these are just some of the terms that he uses. There are more. So again, very frustrating. He never says that these are the same things. You have to um, uh, figure that out on your own. So he also calls objective thought natural or dogmatic attitude. He calls it the prejudice in favor, favor of the objective world or sometimes in favor of the world, prejudice of determinate being or of the world, prejudice in favor of being, also transparent philosophy, objective attitude, and so on and so forth. Usually, objective thought has two manifestations two specific expressions. It can manifest or express itself in two approaches, which seem to be on the surface level to be antagonistic, but are actually two sides of the same coin. We have already talked about this when we, uh, in, in the previous uh, lecture. So in the le lecture on language and speech. So objective thought usually manifests itself either as empiricist approaches, or as intellectualist approaches. And in this particular uh, problem, so in the problem of the other, the empiricist account would simply be that what I'm given is a specific intricate mechanism, and this intricate mechanism affects me through causal pathways, and then I just re respond as a, another complex mechanism. So there is basically no talk of mental or conscious or whatnot. It's just a game of cause and effect. So not only does the other not exist, I as a consciousness or as a mind do not exist. A very popular account nowadays, uh, especially in say contemporary uh, uh, neuro, neuroscience. And then, the opposite account is the intellectualist account, where everything that exists is basically a construct of my consciousness or of, let's say, transcendental ego, which is not necessarily mine. But all the phenomena that we see are somehow constituted by a consciousness or a mind. So uh, the other is basically my own construct, just like this mug is. So this would be a specific version or a reading of the Kantian philosophy. Uh, the reason why I added this specific reading is because you can also understand it differently, so, so from in a different way. But the point being here is that the other basically is does not exist in the in these two accounts, and the problem is uh, pr problem lies in the fact that both of these approaches. Uh, presuppose a specific way of looking at the reality at ourselves. And this common presupposition is what Merleau-Ponty calls objective thought. So I'll just name uh, two such examples where he basically says that the, the, the empiricism and intellectualism are two sides of the same coin. 
at one point he says the naturalism of science this would be the empiricist horn and the spiritualism of the universal constituted constituting subjectivity this would be the intellectualist horn to which reflection of science on science led had this in common that they leveled out experience so they level out level out experience and they just posit one specific type of being as the only possible type of being or as he puts it later on in the text, the two doctrines presuppose the priority of objective thought and endorse only one mode of being, namely objective beings. So at the very center of objective thought is what I would like to call a res mensura. Now this is an allusion to the famous uh, maxim that is a attributed to Protagoras, homo mensura. That's the famous sentence where Protagoras says um, that human being is the measure of all things. Well, in objective thought, thing is the measure of all things. Uh, so thinghood, objectivity, object, and this object is understood in a, in a, uh, in a, um, in a scientific fashion, it is a geometrized object that is embedded into a geometrical time space. This is what is the, the, the um, prototype of existence, the ontological prototype. So the real, according to objective thought, is basically a multiplicity of events external to each other and by, bound by causality. So the world, the reality, is structured in a way, it, 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 the world or reality consists of discrete, that is to say separately existing objects that can be fully and exhaustively described by quantitative approaches and methods. And these objects interrelate through causality. So causality is their main uh, relationship. They exist on their own. So they're individual existences and they can be exhaustively described. So the object, the, the, the geometrized object, as uh, Husserl would put it, it becomes the ideal, the foundation of ontology. And this is the only uh, acceptable uh, being that um, can be allowed into the fundamental uh, uh, conception of reality. So according to objective thought, the world is basically uh, an extremely complex thing that consists of numerous smaller things that are, as I've said, uh, causally interrelated. Well, what with consciousness then? Consciousness has no room in objective thought. So it is either nothing in empiricism or it is a no thing in intellectualism. So something that somehow that somehow transcends the, 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 the realm of the world, something that is coextensive with the world. So in, in Kantianism, this would be consciousness as a condition of possibility for the world. So something that cannot itself be part of the world and cannot itself be described with the categories of the world. So again, world is a huge mega thing, whereas consciousness is either a nothing or a no thing. The function, the function of objective thought is to reduce all phenomena which bear witness to the union of subject and world, putting into place the clear idea of the object as in, in itself and the subject as pure consciousness. So basically, Objective thought creates this huge gap, this huge chasm between things, world, and subject consciousness. And because body, our bodies are basically converted into interiorless things, so they become a yet another, admittedly a very sophisticated and complex, but still just another thing, then the problem of the other, of course, is a natural consequence. If the body is indeed a province of the world, says Merleau-Ponty, 
if it is that object which the biologist talks about, that conjunction of processes analyzed in physiological logical treatises, that collection of organs shown in the plates of books on anatomy, then my experience can be nothing but the dialogue between bare consciousness and the system of objective correlations. So if we use the popular and somewhat sometimes problematic terminology, if I understand my body as a körper and not as a light, then we have a problem because there is a, a, an unbridgeable gap between my consciousness and this particular body. But already here we have a glimmer of solution. Merleau-Ponty says that what we have said before in the phenomenology of perception about the body provides the beginning of a solution to this problem. Why? Because this whole treatise, the whole phenomenology of perception has in fact learned has taught us to shed doubt upon objective thought and has made and has allowed us to make contact on the hither side of scientific representations of the world and the body with an experience of the body and the world world which these scientific approaches do not successfully embrace so if we take on board again what merleau-ponty has done throughout our this discussion so far if we take on board the different conception of the body, then we have already um, uh, at our disposal um, um, tools that will allow us to transcend this particular problem. Why is this so? Because according to Merleau-Ponty, the new conception of the body, the one that he introduced, tells us that the body is the third genus of being, so the third type of being. It is something that is between the pure subject and between the object. And I will not go into this longish quotation about what the body is and how it's interrelated with the world, but the thing is that according to this conception, if you think back to the notion of the phenomenal field, what we have is this interpenetration and interrelation between the embodied subject, the corporeal subject, and the lived world. So the world and the subject are basically intertwined. And the body is always beyond itself. It is never self-enclosed as a pure consciousness, but is, it is basically a transcendence, something that constantly points uh, ahead of itself. This is because it is basically a, a, a temporal structure and the world is that which serves as a landing for this particular body. So the, the specific activities of the body bring forth the specific dimensions of the world which have previously existed only as possibilities, if we can use this terminology. So objective thought uh, with objective thought, the living body became exterior without interior. So there is only the exteriority, but no interiority to the body. Whereas subjectivity or consciousness has become interi interior without exterior. So there is no exteriority, just interiority. The subject or the consciousness has become an impartial spectator. However, with Merleau-Ponty's approach, what we can do now is we can gain a new understanding of both the body and consciousness. And by doing so, we can understand these problems. So what would be the new understanding of the body? If we talk about the, our body as experienced, as lived, our body as given in, the, in our lived experience, what we see is that the body is a vehicle of a form of behavior. So it is a specific vehicle of a behavioral gestalt. It is a vehicle of being in the world. And this holds true both for the body as it is given to myself, my own body, and to the body that I see of the other. In objective thought, on the other hand, the body is merely a segment of matter. It is an assemblage of real parts juxtaposed in space and which exist outside of each other. It is a sum of physical and chemical action. So objective thought sees basically body as another thing. So something that is um, an agglomerate of different parts of different organs and so on and so forth. Whereas 
in the experience, it the, the body is giving as a uniform whole, as something that is basically always projected into a specific project, and as such can only be understood if understood uh, in light of the specific world it is aimed towards, aimed at, it aims at. So, um, how significance and intentionality could come to dwell in a molecular edifices or masses of cells is a thing which can never which can never be made comprehensible and here cartesianism is right so descartes was right when he said that such things as meaning or intentionality can never dwell in body understood as a mass of cells or as a molecular edifice but this is this doesn't have to be the case because according to Merleau-Ponty, we have to recognize that the body as a chemical structure or an agglomeration of tissues is formed by a process of impoverishment from a primordial phenomenon of the body for us, the body of human experience or the perceived body. So the perceived body in a certain sense has a certain priority uh, over the objectivized body. It is something that is part of the overall context in which I can start objectivizing body and seeing it as another object. Uh, and if this is the case, um, the, 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 the problem of the other becomes significantly less severe. In fact, it disappears. And also consciousness changes its meaning. So it it is no longer conceived as a constituting consciousness, as it is in the Kantian tradition, for instance, uh, as a pure being for itself, but is understood as a perceptual consciousness, as the subject of a pattern of behavior, as a being in the world or existence. At, at, at a certain other point where Loponti talks about non-positing consciousness, that is a consciousness not in possession of fully determinate objects. So, there is a conscious, there is an understanding of consciousness that is much broader and deeper than the one that is um, that that is usually introduced in, say, transcendentalist accounts, where you only have the positive consciousness. So the consciousness that is uh, um, 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 that intends only a specific object and a very only a determinate. Object. There are always, there's also an understanding of consciousness that intends phenomena that are not objects, that intends, say, certain moods or what have. In some, for these conditions, if we reconceptualize the body, if we reconceptualize the consciousness, if we open up these two notions, the ant ant antinomies of objective thought vanish because we are no longer imprisoned in this particular prototype of being, which is called object or objective being. If my consciousness has a body, as it can have in this broader conception of consciousness and body, why should other bodies not have consciousness? So if I can understand my own consciousness in a way that allows it to be permeated with my own corporeality, why would it be problem to say that the other bodies that I see are permeated with consciousness? So perceiving and perceived self, so my self, the, the, the self that is perceiving and the self that is being perceived, the self of the other, are not cogitaciones, as Descartes would put it, shut up in their own Im imminence. So they are not something that would be shut up in their own uh, realm of subjectivity, but they are beings which are outrun by their world and which consequently may well be outrun by each other. So just as my body is never self-enclosed, but is basically a transcendence, which is, which, which is um, uh, thrown into a specific world, which aimed aims or projects into a certain world, well, the same could be said of the other. You know, the other is equally accessible to me, although in a different way than certain objects that I'm confronted with. And here we enter into the realm of the incorporeality. 
because the other is not my construction. The other that I see is not uh, as uh, uh, the, uh, the advocates of the intellectualist approaches would claim my the construct of my own consciousness, but is a corporeal subject. Insofar as I have sensory functions, insofar that is to say is insofar as there is a, a natural time running through me and I have visual, auditory and tactile field, I am already in communication with others taken as similar psychophysical subjects. So the natural time, uh, the natural corporeal self that anchors me in the pre-reflective world is what allows me to also be anchored in other lived corporeal, other uh, living corporeal beings. We are both psychophysical subjects and as such, we are anchored in a world and have access to one another. Round about the perceived body, when I see the body of vortex forms, so a vortex towards which my, wor my world is drawn and so to speak sucked in, already the other body has ceased to be a mere fragment of the world and became the theater of a certain process of elaboration and as it were a certain view of the world. When I see the other, I don't see the other as another thing because I already see him or her as another view of the world, another attitude of the world, another polarity or another uh, projection into the world. So I can see the other as a living being. This is something that is given pre-reflectively. This is not something that I really have to think about. Unlike most of uh, schools of, traditional schools of philosophy uh, would like to claim because the other, as a living being is merely a prolongation of my own familiar dealing with the world. The other as a living being is inhabited by the anonymous existence as myself. So this is something that is given pre-reflected. Only people who find themselves in the pits of uh, uh, psychological tur turmoil, for example, people who are suffering from schizophrenia might be uh, uh, deprived of this of the other being given as a living being. But the other is also given as another person. So, you know, Merleau-Ponty would not like to claim that just because the other is given to me pre-reflectively in a very direct, in, um, direct way that I, that I have immediate access to the other. No, because this other is also, as Merleau-Ponty says, not only an anonymous existence, but also an open life. So the other, brings his or her own projects into the world. I can see the other use the objects I'm familiar with in different ways. So the other is also a minded being and as such, that other is not given to me directly. And language says Merleau-Ponty, and this ties in nicely with what we, were, what we said in the previous lecture, is uh, a cultural object that is um, especially important when we try to understand each other at the level of personhood, when I want to understand the other as a person, language is what allows what Merleau-Ponty calls a dual being. So, for example, I, I won't read the whole uh, uh, quote here, but Merleau-Ponty says, in the experience of dialogue, there is constituted between the other person and myself a common ground. So the language, the way we use the language, we are able to become in sync with one another. My thought and his are interwoven into a single fabric. This is what he means when he talks about the dual being. There is a specific reciprocity in between us because the, basically our, um, our thoughts are expressed in and through the language, in and through the words that we use, in and through the speech uh, that we use. And this is something that is given to both of us and allows us to erect a specific context in which we can establish a common ground. This is where Merleau-Ponty criticizes Sartre. Now, I, I thought I was, uh, originally I wanted to say more on this. I wanted to say more on Merleau-Ponty's critique of Sartre. And Merleau-Ponty devotes quite a lot of time 
uh, to this question in this particular passage. And I have skipped all those passages. Well, for the most part, I'll just mention one. But I would just like to let you know that one, when you read this particular section, and there are parts where, he, where you see that he is entering into a specific polemic with someone, and you're not really sure who he is uh, discussing, so who, who, uh, who his opponent is, it's very probably Sartre. So when he's talking about these overtly intellectualized approaches, so these approaches that have a intellectualist feel to them, it is Sartre for the most part that he has in mind. So one of the things, one of the ways Sartre wanted to solve the problem of the other is by saying that even though I'm a consciousness, when I'm confronted with the other, the gaze of the other, so in the eyes of the other, I become an object. So the other basically denies me as a subject by objectivizing me. And it is through the other that I realize that I am also an object. So there is an objective dimension to me. And I do the same to the other. So it is in the intersubjective domain where basically this subject object dichotomy falls apart. So the other is responsible for my realizing that I'm not a pure consciousness, but I also have an objective dimension to me and vice versa. But Merleau-Ponty says that this is an overtly intellectual picture of the happening of the event. In fact, he says, the other's gaze transforms me into an object and mine him only if both of us withdraw into the core of our thinking nature. If we both make ourselves into an inhuman gaze, if each of us feels his action to be taken up and understood, but observed uh, to be not taken up and understood, but observed as if they were an insect. So when I objectivize someone, this is something that I can do, but this is something that is not the primary way of my relating to the other. I can objectivize the other when I clamber into my intellectual sphere. So when I withdraw into the core of my thinking nature, when I perceive the other only through the lens, through the lens of my intellect, this is where I objectivize someone. But there is a more primordial way of relating to the other, which is not relegated to the domain of the intellect, but is relegated to the domain of the body. So in Sartre, the relation is basically intellectual. According to Merleau-Ponty, this is problematic because the, the objectifying stance is a derived, a secondary stance. But there is a primary stance which uh, draws on the bodily reciprocity. So Berlopunti says in, 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 in the section on language that we've covered, it is through my body that I understand people. So my body has lived, allows me a specific understanding of the other. And this happens in, in a way where the other's person intention inhabit my body and mine his. There is a mutual confirmation between myself and the others. So when I perceive the other, it is almost as if I would kind of um, anchor myself in that person and the other in myself. And the reason why this is possible, because I can recognize the specific behavioral patterns that I see. So when I say I, basically, my body does this. So my body is able to synchronize at, us at a very uh, fundamental, at a specific pre-reflective level. So even before I start thinking about the other, about what that other is doing, there is a specific synchronicity between us. And you can see this basically in most of our everyday interaction, where there's a lot of this synchronization going on. For instance, uh, when you talk to someone, this is the famous example that Dreyfus, for example, uh, that the, the Dreyfus often uh, used. Uh, there is a specific distance um, between you and the other person when you talk. And nobody has really taught you what the appropriate distance is. You just kind of sense it. 
And this is something that immediately happens. And you always have those people that people that don't really have the feeling for this and they kind of all constantly intrude into your space and you always try to get away. But there's also a certain distance that would seem just awkward, too far away. Uh, and this would be immediately corrected. And that's just one example. And there are so many. When I'm delivering a lecture, I'm doing all kinds of uh, bodily movements that you don't really notice on a conscious level, but it is something that plays a in tremendously important role in intersubjectivity, intersubjective synchronization. And Merleau-Ponty provides this example of a baby that's only 15 months old, where you know I take the finger of the baby and I pretend that I'm biting, like I'm doing so. And the baby finds it amusing and the baby itself starts to open its mouth and do doing the same gesture. Clearly, this is not an intellectual operation. Clearly, this is not something that the baby did by inference, by analogy, you know, by realizing, well, you know, when I when I see myself in the mirror, I see something similar to what this guy has when, you know, the teeth and uh, whatnot. So there's not no uh, inferential process there. Um, the way Merleau-Ponty phrases it is as follows. And yet it, that is to say, the baby has scarcely looked at its face in a glass and its teeth are not in any case like mine. The fact is that its own mouth and teeth as it feels them from the inside are immediately for it an apparatus to bite with. And my jaw as the baby sees it from the outside is immediately for it capable of the same intention. Biting has immediately for it an intersubjective significance. So the baby sees this particular action and it doesn't just see random physical happenings. It sees the overall intention, which it immediately recognizes with its corporeal schema, takes it up with its corporeal schema and performs the same, the same movement without having to think about this. It perceives its intentions in its body and my body with its own, and thereby my inten intentions in its own body. Okay, I'll skip this. Uh, so one thing that we can say here is that the phenomenological reduction, if done properly, does not bring us to the transcendent transcendental ego, which is somehow completely dis or unworlded, that is severed from the world. In fact, what we get is a transcendental intersubjectivity. So uh, the subjectivity that is always already embedded in a specific intersubjective setting. Transcendental subjectivity is a revealed subjectivity, revealed to itself and to others, and is for that reason an intersubjectivity. So when I'm performing a phenomenolog phenomenological reduction, this is basically an act, an activity. So I have to either think, and I usually think in a way where I use language, I write down things, I talk to people. So all these are actions that are heavily intersubjectively um, colored. They are basically determined in a very important way with the intersubjective meanings. So what I find is, ultimately, I find a corporeal self, and this corporeal self is uh, uh, intersubjective self. So the last thing that I will say, apparently I won't have time to talk about the question of transcendence, even though unfortunately, it, or ironically, it's the fundamental problem of the whole book. Um, I would like to uh, say a few words about the social. So now that Merleau-Ponty has kind of fleshed out or, or sketched out the his attempted solution of the problem of intersubjectivity through the notion of uh, intercorporeality, so uh, through the notion of this uh, corporeal synchronicity. He uh, touches upon the question of how social, from this perspective, is given to us. So we live in social uh, situation, we live in social environments. So what can this particular understanding of the body and intersubjectivity tell us about uh, the, the, the social environment we live in. And he says that the social is primarily given as a summoning. This is the word he uses. Or 
we can also say that it is given as a solicitation. It is something that is given prior to knowledge or judgment. Let me read, let me try to explain what, what uh, he means by that. So there are these specific identities that are present, these specific, um, specific uh, social phenomena we are embedded in, such as nation, class, and so on and so forth. Now, the question is, you know, what determines um, my na national identity, my class identity, and so on and so forth? On the one hand, Merleau-Ponty says, it is not, th these are not, these do not fall under the rubric of faith. These, do, these are not determined by some self-existing objective parameters that um, are out there in the world. So I'm not just, you know, uh, put into a chain of social causal, uh, in, so uh, embedded into a, a setting of social causes and effects. I'm not determined by say, you know, my average income, I'm not determined by a specific cult cultural, cultural symbols and so on and so forth. So it's not like these entities, national class, are not something that exists outside of me and simply determines me from the outside. This is something that empiricist, uh, uh, an empiricist would claim. But these are also not something that is strictly a matter of voluntary decision. So I do not simply decide that I am um, 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 a member of a proletariat class or that I am a Slovene or a Croat or whatnot. So these are not something that is related strictly to the intellect as an intellectualist would claim. So it is not a matter of voluntary decision. No. What determines, say, the nationhood or the class identity is the situation. So these are given to me as a situation. I live them. They are in between the external and the internal. They unfold in this phenomenal field, which we've uncovered through our meetings. And I will read a slightly lengthy quote, and then I will end. Um, I will read it because it's very interesting and very telling and also um, um, very concrete, I would say. In all revolutions, says Merleau-Ponty, there are members of the privileged class who make common cause with revolutionaries and members of the oppressed class who remain faithful to the privileged. And every nation has its traitors. So you cannot simply say that, you know, I don't know, that the average income determines the class consciousness or class identity, because you always have members of the bourgeoisie that will join the revolutionary classes or members of the proletariat who will refuse to join the revolutionary movement and so on and so forth. This is because the nation and class are neither versions of faith which hold the individual in subjection from the outside. So they are not determined from the outside, nor are they values which he posits from within. So they are not something that you simply uh, decide on. They are not something that you choose freely. Instead, they are, as Merleau-Ponty puts it, modes of coexistence, which are a call upon him. What does that mean? What does it mean that a certain something, a certain cultural something is a call upon you? Under conditions of calm, when you live your everyday life, the nation and the class are stimuli to which I respond only absent-mindedly or confusedly. So I live in a specific setting. And this specific setting has a specific structure that I live to somehow navigate. I don't even know that the specific identity that I'm living through, that I'm embodying, is a national identity or a social identity. When things are calm, this is something that is given to me explicitly. It is something that is given to me on my existential horizon. It suffuses my existence, but not in a way uh, that I would be aware of it. Very often, I'm not aware of it. Of course, I can be if, if, for example, this is part of the educational system or whatnot. But it is more similar to, say, uh, a fish that lives in water. The water itself is basically just 
there. It is a, a medium it moves through. But in extreme situations, say in a revolutionary situation, uh, this situation transformed those pre-conscious relationships with class and nation, hitherto merely lived through, into the definite taking of a stand. The tacit commitment becomes explicit but it appears to itself as interior to decision. So in the, in the situations, in the, in the conditions of calm, I live a specific, uh, I live through a specific intersubjective milieu, which has a unique dynamics. It has a unique dynamics that pertains to a specific class, that pertains to a specific nation. And this is something that is given to me only latently, implicitly. I am not explicitly and consciously aware of these facts until there, there comes a specific situation where this becomes important and it moves out of the background and becomes a figure. And this is where I can basically decide to take a stand towards this. I've noticed that I lived a specific life. I've lived a life as a, as a, a member of the proletariat. I've lived a life as a member of a specific nation. But at this point, I can sever ties with this and restructure my mode of being, or, or I can fully embrace it and take on the beckonings, the calls, that are present there. So this is what Merleau-Ponty is saying, that the social is given to me not as an object of reflective thought for the most part, but merely as something to be lived through or lived through. And well, phenomenological reduction that leads me back into this transcendental intersubjectivity also leads me into this ambiguous life and do not enter into the realm of transcendental ego where everything is given to me as a spectacle everything is transparent uh, i i can see all the things in my realm of experience as being constituted in specific in and through specific acts here what i arrive at is this ambiguous life where there are islands of clarity that are embedded into these huge oceans of indeterminacy of ambiguity. Okay, I will end here. Um, let me just stop the recording. Thank you for your time and your attention and patience.